Well, hello there. This is Lucifer Means Lightbringer, a.k.a. LML, host of the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire podcast. Thanks for joining us on our first episode of LML TV, where we'll try to solve one of the deep mysteries of A Song of Ice and Fire. What was the cause of the long night? What you're about to watch will be a condensed version of some of the main ideas in our podcast, cut down into tasty bite-sized morsels and accompanied by spiffy visual aids. Thanks, Michael Clarfeld and new theme music. Thanks, Mr. John Walsh. LML TV is made possible by our generous Patreon supporters, so all thanks to them. Now let me confess to you, straight out, that this video is going to be a little different than some of the other Song of Ice and Fire videos that you might have seen, and that we'll be dealing with a lot of heavy symbolism and metaphor. But that's a good thing, because symbolism and metaphor have a very large and exciting part to play in a Song of Ice and Fire. In fact, and this is kind of our mission statement, if you will, the key to solving the mysteries of a song of ice and fire lies in its internal folklore and symbolism. George R. R. Martin is a well-known lover of mythology, and he's put a lot of thought into creating his own tapestry of legends and folktales that can be found scattered about the books. For example, the Starks tell tales of Brandon the Builder, who learned the language of the children of the forest, and is credited with building everything from the Wall to Storm's End to the High Tower of Old Town to the first stones of Winterfell itself. Busy guy, right? Now, the Ironborn may be a bunch of thieving pirates, but they're thieving pirates with colorful folklore. Their cultural hero is a swashbuckling fellow named the Grey King, who slew the sea dragon and taught the Ironborn to make long ships and weave nets, and who even stole the fire of the gods like Prometheus. Elsewhere, we hear talk of such luminaries as Durin God's Grief, Garth the Green, Lan the Clever, Huger of the Hill, and of course everybody knows Night's King, the last hero, and Azor High, that wife-stabbing bastard with the flaming sword. What I'm here to tell you today is that these fables are more than just colorful backstory. More than just very creative world building, although they are that. These fables are actually the key to understanding the greater context of the main story, because these ancient legends of A Song of Ice and Fire are actually being reenacted by the main characters in the books, all throughout the series. That's right, it's not just a matter of trying to figure out who is Azor Ahai Reborn. Is it John? Or Danny? Or maybe both? We actually see echoes of Lan the Clever in Tyrion's story, and the brothers Baratheon, all three, seem to draw a lot of influence from the tales of Durin God's Grief and Garth the Green. In fact, Pretty much all of the characters are at one time or another reprising some archetypal role set out in the Dawn Age and the Age of Heroes, often in their most crucial scenes. Many people in the fandom have already picked up on the abundant parallels and plot echoes between various characters and events that can be found throughout the story, but what I'm saying is that this concept goes a lot further. All of these parallel events and characters are dancing a dance which was choreographed 8,000 years ago or more in fictional history. I like to call A Song of Ice and Fire a fractal story because its patterns seem to flow backwards and forwards in time, and the ancient myths are like something of a Rosetta Stone, like an original template. So by considering the important scenes of the main story with an eye for echoes of the ancient legends, we can actually learn quite a lot. And that's exactly what we do on our podcast. In fact, the reason why I feel compelled to write about A Song of Ice and Fire and make podcasts and videos in the first place is simply because this mirroring of the ancient myths of the main story is so damn cool and clever and interesting that I just have to tell as many people as I can. No matter how many times you may have read or reread the series, I believe that I can show you a whole new dimension to the story, one which deserves to be appreciated by anyone who loves A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones. By way of example, we shall dedicate this first video episode of LML TV to considering the mystery of what caused the long night. It's one of the very best mysteries in the books, so it seems like a good place to start. But we'll begin not by talking about the others and Westeros, as you might expect, but instead with a relatively obscure Carthine legend given to us in the first book. In a game of thrones, Daenerys Targaryen is wandering the Dothraki Sea with Khal Drogo's Khalasar. About halfway through the book, shortly after Danny has begun to acclimate to life amongst the Dothraki, the talk turns to her dragon's eggs, and her Lyseni handmaiden Daria 
relates to her a Carthine legend about the origin of dragons. Here it is. A trader from Carth once told me that dragons came from the moon, Blonde Dorea said as she warmed a towel over the fire. Silvery wet hair tumbled across her eyes as Danny turned her head, curious. The moon? He told me the moon was an egg, Khaleesi, the Lysine girl said. Once there were two moons in the sky, but one wandered too close to the sun and cracked from the heat. A thousand thousand dragons poured forth and drank the fire of the sun. That is why dragons breathe flame. One day the other moon will kiss the sun too, and then it will crack and the dragons will return. The two Dothraki girls giggled and laughed. You are foolish, strawhead slave, Eri said. Moon is no egg. Moon is God, woman, wife of sun. It is known. It is known, Jiki agreed. Now, I think it's clear that there's some amount of symbolism going on here, as we can pretty much immediately rule out the idea of the flying and flapping dragons from the story, like Drogon, having literally flown out of the center of a cracked open moon. That just wouldn't make any sense in a story like A Song of Ice and Fire, I think it's fair to say. So to try to get an idea of what this old legend might really be talking about, let's start by considering the basic pattern of symbols laid out here. A moon wanders too close to the sun, cracks from the heat, and gives birth to fire-breathing dragons. If you think about it, we actually saw that same basic pattern at the end of A Game of Thrones, as Danny acts out this entire myth while hatching her dragons. All right, so check this out. It all starts with the interesting pet names that Danny and Drogo give each other. Drogo calls Danny the moon of my life, while Danny calls him her sun and stars. This means that in terms of symbolism, we can think of Drogo as a sun person, what I would call a solar king, and we can think of Danny as a lunar woman, a moon maiden, if you will. That sun and moon, husband and wife relationship is alluded to in the scene with Danny and her handmaidens that we just quoted from, as Eri and Jiki counter the Carthine tale of the moon being like an egg by asserting that, in fact, the sun and moon are god and goddess, husband and wife. So now, think back to that memorable scene where Danny hatches her dragon's eggs in Khal Drogo's funeral pyre. If Drogo is the sun, then his pyre would be the fire of the sun, and the dragons hatch precisely when Danny the moon maiden wanders too close to the sun's fire, just like the Carthine tale. Danny's dragon's eggs crack from the heat of Solar Drogo's fire, just as the second moon of the Carthine legend was said to have been scalded by the sun's fire and cracked open like an egg. From these cracked open stone eggs, the dragons are born, just as the cracked open second moon egg was said to have given birth to dragons. It's a mythical reenactment, and it's not the only one. It isn't a totally perfect analogy, and it never will be, but it's close enough for us to identify the intentional correlation. For example, Danny is the moon, so to match the myth as literally as possible, she really should walk into Drogo's pyre and then herself crack open, with dragons leaping from her chest cavity like something out of aliens. That wouldn't make sense for the plot, though, so the dragon's eggs that she places in the pyre around Drogo's body also serve as a symbol of the moon egg being immersed in the sun's fire, in parallel to Daenerys, the moon maiden. This works especially well because, of course, the Carthine tale describes the moon as being like an egg. And although Dany doesn't crack open from the heat, she does undergo a kind of blood-burning, transformation, death and rebirth experience. The thing that really makes it clear, however, is the simple fact that Dany is called, say it with me, the mother of dragons about a billion times, and often thinks of the dragons as her children. Therefore, Danny makes for a pretty on-the-nose correlation to the second moon, which was said to have cracked open and given birth to dragons after being scalded by the fire of the sun, when she walks into Drogo's pyre and wakes the dragons. From this, we can draw several conclusions. One, the old myths and legends of A Song of Ice and Fire are, to some extent, being paralleled or reenacted by the main characters in the story. This means that, two, the myths and folk tales are probably important and worth taking a closer look at. And three, some amount of symbolism seems to be involved. The moon and sun roles are here played by people who are nicknamed moon and sun, and the dragon's eggs also play the moon role. Now you can begin to see why I said at the beginning that the symbolism and folklore of A Song of Ice and Fire are the keys to going beyond the surface story. We still need to figure out why Martin is creating these parallels, though, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, as it may have occurred to you, Danny's Waking of the Dragons is more commonly regarded as a likely fulfillment of a different ancient legend, that of the prophecy of the rebirth of Azor Ahai. The best version of this prophecy comes to us in A Clash of Kings, out of the mouth of, who else, Melisandre. In this scene, she's speaking to Davos as he's imprisoned beneath Dragonstone, after being caught with merely the intention of trying to kill Melisandre. Because Melisandre is psychic, and intending to kill her is as close as you can get. Here's the quote. It is night in your seven kingdoms now, the Red Woman went on, but soon the sun will rise again. The war continues, Davos Seaworth, and some will soon learn that even an ember in the ashes can still ignite a great blaze. The old maester looked at Stannis and saw only a man. You see a king. You are both wrong. He is the Lord's chosen, the warrior of fire. I have seen him leading the fight against the dark. I have seen it in the flames. The flames do not lie, else you would not be here. It is written in prophecy as well. When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor Ahai shall be born again amid smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. The bleeding star has come and gone, and Dragonstone is the place of smoke and salt. Stannis Baratheon is Azor Ahai reborn. Her red eyes blazed like twin fires and seemed to stare deep into his soul. Mel is speaking here of waking literal dragons from stone, which she hopes to accomplish with blood magic and human sacrifice. But Daenerys already did that, waking dragons from stone with the use of blood magic and human sacrifice, and she did indeed do it as soon as the red comet, the bleeding star, appeared low on the horizon as the first star of evening. Danny doesn't have the flaming sword usually associated with the Zora High Reborn, but most people in the fandom have intuited that the dragons are her incarnation of Lightbringer. Not only do I agree with this interpretation, I would go further and say that the parallel between Lightbringer and dragons is of central importance to the story. Now there are a lot of clues about Danny's dragons being her version of Lightbringer, but the most straightforward one comes in A Dance with Dragons, as Zarozo and Daxos speaks to Daenerys about the dangerous specter of Dragonlord rule which her prized pets represent. When your dragons were small, they were a wonder. Grown, they are death and devastation, a flaming sword above the world. Well, there you have it. Danny's dragons are like a flaming sword. So we don't even need to feel bad that Danny doesn't have the flaming sword, because the dragons do the trick. And they're probably more impressive anyway. But there is actually another very important symbol of Lightbringer present at Danny's dragon hatching party besides the dragons, and that would be the Red Comet itself. We already know that many view it as a herald of the rebirth of Azor Ahai, and that it's a major part of the prophecy. But it's worth noting that the Red Comet itself is described a lot like Lightbringer by the other characters who see it. I'm getting ready to hit the symbolism turbo button now, so hold on tight, and this comes from A Clash of Kings. It was splendid and scary all at once. The red sword, the bull named it. He claimed it looked like a sword, the blade still red hot from the forge. When Arya squinted the right way, she could see the sword too, only it wasn't a new sword, it was ice, her father's great sword, all ripply Valyrian steel, and the red was Lord Eddard's blood on the blade after Sir Illyn the King's justice had cut off his head. Yorin had made her look away when it happened, yet it seemed to her that the comet looked like ice must have after. Lightbringer, the Red Sword of Heroes is first and foremost a sword of blood and fire, because it was covered in Nissa Nissa's blood in order to be set on fire. Lightbringer was infamously stained red by Nissa Nissa's blood, and it was said to burn fiery hot in battle. Blood and fire are its two main attributes, in other words, and it turns out that the comet is pretty much always described as either bleeding or burning by the various people who observe it. Here in this scene, Arya and Gendry each nail one of these attributes. Gendry sees the comet as a fiery red hot sword, while Arya sees it as a blood-soaked sword, and both are good descriptions of Lightbringer. Gendry even nicknames the comet the Red Sword, which is then picked up and repeated by Arya. Now, neither Arya or Gendry have heard of Azor Ahai at this point in the story, but this scene does serve as an excellent clue to us readers that the Red Comet itself can be used as a symbol of Lightbringer the blood-stained red sword of fire that we all know and love. The Red Comet is like a flying Lightbringer for all intents and purposes. 
as a further wrinkle to the idea of Arya seeing the red comet as Ned's ice, covered in Ned's blood, I'll point out that a bloody sword called ice makes for a particularly apt symbol of a comet, since comets have a core primarily made up of ice, rock, and dirt. And because, of course, comets are called bleeding stars in A Song of Ice and Fire. So, bloody ice. The comet's symbolism actually continues when ice is eventually reforged into Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale. In A Feast for Crows, we get a description of Oathkeeper's pommel, and it calls the red comet to mind. A golden lion's head with ruby eyes that shone like two red stars. Its crossguard also flames gold, adding the direct implication of a flaming sword. Better still, the blades of Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale have steel which is dyed partially blood red making them bloody red swords after a fashion, just like Lightbringer and the Red Comet. When Sansa saw Sir Elian Payne holding ice during the Battle of the Blackwater, she made note of the fact that Sir Elian doesn't clean the blood off the blade after using it. So again, we're given the symbolic idea of ice being stained red by blood. And again, I will say that this compares very well to the idea of Lightbringer being stained red by Nyssa Nyssa's blood, enhancing the connection that Arya made between the Red Comet and ice running red with blood. Said another way, ice and its children, Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper, are effectively uniting the symbolism of Lightbringer and the Red Comet. All right, so the Red Comet is like a sword of blood and fire, and it can symbolize Lightbringer, which is a sword of blood and fire. Danny's dragons can also symbolize Lightbringer, or play the role of Lightbringer, as we mentioned, and this means that besides being a flaming sword, Lightbringer can also be a dragon or a comet. Just to complete the circle, the Red Comet is in turn directly associated with dragons on several occasions, and that's outside of the context of the Azor High prophecy. Old Nan famously claims to be able to smell the comet, and says that it means, Dragons, boy! While Melisandre and Queen Selyse over on Dragonstone say that it is Dragon's Breath. Red Comet means one thing, boy. Dragons. Danny names it the dragon's tail, right before setting Drogo's pyre on fire and waking the dragons. And thousands of miles away, Sansa Stark hears some of the citizens of King's Landing calling it the dragon's tail as well. I guess it was just sort of in the air. <laughs> Here George is really just borrowing from a simple yet profound mythological tradition. The practice of interpreting comets and falling meteors as flying, fire-breathing dragons and serpents can be found from China to India to ancient Persia to North and South America and who knows how many other places. It's easy to see why. Comets and meteors fly through the air, breathe fire when they enter the atmosphere, they land with a roar and a boom, and they bring death and devastation everywhere they go. Thus, we can see that the associations between dragons and comets exist both inside and outside of A Song of Ice and Fire. In other words, all of the symbols around Azor Ahai are somewhat interchangeable. Red comets, red swords, and fire-breathing dragons. They can all be used to symbolize one another in what I like to call a symbolism three-way. You'll notice that in the quote, where Zaro likens Danny's dragons to a flaming sword, he actually makes the dragons sound like comets by saying that they are a flaming sword above the world. That's just how Arya and Gendry saw the Red Comet, as a flaming sword above the world, a flying lightbringer. And by comparing the Red Comet to Ned's sword, which is Valerian steel and thus forged in dragonfire, Arya has effectively labeled the Red Comet a bloody flying dragon sword, and that's exactly the right idea. A plus for Arya in the symbolism department. Now that we've got that down, let's return to Danny and the dragon hatching scene so you can see just what it is that Martin is doing with this whole comets, dragons, and flaming swords thing. That's right, it's not just symbolism for the fun of it, it actually means something. This scene should really have our attention now because it seems to be simultaneously reenacting the Carthian legend of dragons coming from the moon as well as fulfilling the prophecy of Azor High's return to wake dragons under a bleeding star. We must ask the question, what's the meaning of this? Is it possible that the Carthian moon dragon legend has something to do with the original Azor Ahai and the Long Night? Could these myths be perhaps related to one another? Well, there's a big, giant, moon-sized clue that this is the case. The 
The moon cracking open is kind of the central part of the Carthian myth. You really can't miss it. It's very dramatic. It's where the dragons come from. But there's also something about the moon cracking tucked into the background of the original Azor High fable. And here I will quote from A Clash of Kings, where Solidor's son relates the tale to Davos Seaworth. A hundred days and a hundred nights he labored on the third blade, and as it glowed white hot in the sacred fires, he summoned his wife. Nissa Nissa, he said to her, for that was her name. Bear your breast and know that I love you best of all that is in this world. She did this thing, why I cannot say, and Azor Ahai thrust the smoking sword through her living heart. It is said that her cry of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon, but her blood and her soul and her strength and her courage all went into the steel. Such is the tale of the forging of Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. Aha! It's another moon cracking. It's not described as a second moon here, just the moon. But now we have two stories that seem to be referring to some sort of extreme lunar catastrophe. That means that, beneath the shroud of legend and time, we might be dealing with the stylized memory of some real celestial event involving the moon that went down thousands of years ago, again in pretend fictional history. That causes us to wonder what the more plausible interpretation of fire-breathing dragons coming from the moon might actually be. A trader from Karth told me that dragons come from the moon. The moon? He told me the moon was an egg, Khaleesi. That once there were two moons in the sky, but one wandered too close to the sun and it cracked from the heat. Out of it poured a thousand thousand dragons, and they drank the sun's fire. We're ready to solve that puzzle now, as a matter of fact. As we've said, dragons can be mythological descriptions for both comets and falling meteors. And aren't falling meteors just what we should expect if a moon were to somehow crack in whole or in part? Yes, indeed. A cracked moon would lead to moon meteors. Probably quite a lot of them. I think that's the most sensible interpretation of the Carthian myth. Something bad happened to the moon, and as a result, a thousand thousand fiery dragon meteors rained down on the planetus, or the girth if you prefer. Dragons coming from the moon. Now there's a clue about there being a link between Azor High and meteor showers in the scene at Dragonstone in A Clash of Kings, where Melisandre burns the statues of the Seven and has Stannis draw a flaming sword from the pyre, in an effort to sort of encourage the Azor High prophecy to come true. Uh, that's not how prophecy works, of course, but the notable thing here is that Melisandre words the prophecy of Azor High's return a bit differently, saying, In ancient books of Ashai, it is written that there will come a day after a long summer when the stars bleed and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. In this dread hour, a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword, and that sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes, and he who clasps it shall be Azor Ahai come again, and the darkness shall flee before him. All right, so this time it's not a bleeding star, but instead a reference to when the stars bleed, as in more than one bleeding star. That's a meteor shower she's talking about. A firestorm of fiery dragons woken from stone. And because dragons and comets can both be described as flaming swords, you could see this shower of bleeding stars as a rain of flaming swords. You might even call this a storm of swords, or a dance with dragons. I mean, if one were so inclined. Now, the story of Azor Ahai forging Lightbringer with the lifeblood of Nissa, Nissa and cracking the moon is said to have taken place at the time of the Long Night. And remember, that's the question I said we were going to try to answer. What was the cause of the Long Night? Well, the answer is right in front of us now. Fiery Moon Meteor Dragons. They are the ones who caused the Long Night. All right, we're getting ready to talk about science and magic, and this is very controversial, so we're going to keep our voices down. And I brought you in a little closer. So, when a comet or meteor impacts on the Earth, the enormous amount of smoke, ash, and debris thrown into the atmosphere can be so great that it turns out the lights, so to speak, for several years, leaving the daytime gray and very overcast, and the nights pitch black with no stars. 
This is called an impact winter, and it's very similar to a volcanic winter, where that same clouding of the atmosphere is accomplished via volcanic ash and debris. Nuclear weapons can theoretically do it too, and that's called a nuclear winter, though thank God we've never had to experience that and hopefully never will. In any case, nuclear weapons and volcanoes are not the primary suspects here. No, here we have very ancient legends telling us about the cracking of a moon and about the moon meteor dragons that came flying out. This is exactly the sort of thing that could have caused a long night type of scenario. And that's before we factor in the inevitable layer of magic. And by that, I mean this. Magic in A Song of Ice and Fire seems to be rooted in the elements, and the elements are often the conduits of magical power. The Doom of Valyria is a great example of this. It was a volcanic explosion, which left a magical fallout zone that's persisted a solid four centuries in counting. That was not a regular volcanic explosion, clearly, but instead one pumped up on magical steroids with magical consequences, and therefore appropriate for a fantasy story. I'd expect a meteor impact event to be very similar. Now we all know that the Danes supposedly made a magic sword from a fallen meteorite, referred to as a pale stone of magic powers by the maesters in the world of ice and fire. This is a really good clue that meteors can indeed be magical in this story. The world of ice and fire also serves up a legend from far eastern Essos about a great empire of the dawn, which supposedly collapsed at the time of the long night, and the guy held responsible, some evil dude named the Bloodstone Emperor, was said to worship a black stone that fell from the sky, and also to practice every kind of dark magic. That's another clue about meteor activity around the time of the Long Night, and another clue about magic tied to meteors. And even the guy's name, Bloodstone, kind of sounds like a comet, which is a flying stone regarded as a bleeding star, a bloody stone. Azor High actually comes in at the end of that Great Empire of the Dawn story, encouraging us to think that this fable and its black meteor might be connected to the rumored moon-cracking activity in the Azor High myth. Now, it isn't just volcanoes and meteors that have been infused with magic in A Song of Ice and Fire. Consider Obsidian, a prime example of how the magic of this story is constructed from natural qualities. Obsidian is literally cooled magma, so George calls it dragonglass and imbues it with the qualities of fire magic, which turns out to be super handy for killing the menacing ice demons. As for those menacing ice demons, the others themselves are like the worst parts of a winter storm, manifested through magic in corporeal form. The Roinar wielded some kind of water magic, and some sort of freaky water magic thing seems to have happened to Patchface under the sea. Then we have the Valerians and the Reloris, who both use magic based in fire. And I would say that it's pretty clear that the Green Seer magic is rooted in the power of nature. Point being, most of the magic in A Song of Ice and Fire seems to be inspired by the forces of nature or to flow through the forces of nature. And in this kind of universe, it seems inevitable that comets and these hypothetical moon meteors I'm proposing would possess an aspect of magic. The fallout from such an impact event would not have been merely the conventional smoke and ash and debris, but would have contained a magical component as well, as the Doom of Valyria did. I believe this to be in line with Martin saying that the cause of the imbalance of the seasons is a magical one and can't be explained by complex theories about binary star systems and calculating orbits and whatnot. Ash and debris can cloud the sky and shut out the sun, and they can cause the temperature to fall, but that does not create imbalanced seasons nor turn loose hordes of ravenous ice demons. Ultimately, this long night catastrophe comes down to magic. But as with all magic in A Song of Ice and Fire, I am proposing that it's loosely based on a natural process, that of a meteor impact and an impact winter. So think of it as a meteor impact, but on magical steroids, and I think you'll have the right idea. Okay, now that we've briefly addressed the hot-button topic of science and magic in A Song of Ice and Fire, good to settle that one finally, <laughs> we can turn our eyes back to the myth and the story and go for the kill. From here, we can actually deduce how it was that the moon suffered this great calamity, again by looking to the correlations between the ancient legends and the main story. The sun and moon can be seen as husband and wife, and the Carthine tale has the solar husband 
essentially killing his lunar wife with his solar heat. That's a pretty good match for the Azor High story, where a man called the Warrior of Fire kills his wife, whose death triggers the moon's death. Thus, Azor High would seem to parallel the sun and Nissa Nissa the moon, just like Danny and Drogo at the dragon hatching scene paralleling the sun and moon. Now, Azor Ahai was said to have stabbed Nissa Nissa with Lightbringer, and we know Lightbringer can be a comet, so the sun stabbed the moon with a comet? Yes! That's why the Red Comet heralds the rebirth of Azor Ahai and the waking of dragons. A comet literally struck the moon and woke the dragons from stone, a celestial parallel for Azor Ahai stabbing Nissa Nissa to create Lightbringer. Again, we would be talking about a magic comet here, and if it was anything like the red comet in the main story, it was probably a massive comet, as the one in the story that we saw was as bright as the moon at night, stretched halfway across the sky, and was visible even during the day. Now, the only way that it could look in the sky as if the sun was holding the comet like a sword at the moment that it struck the moon would be if the sun and moon were very close to one another, perhaps in an eclipse alignment. As it happens, that's exactly what is suggested by the phrase, the moon wandered too close to the sun. It didn't wander out of orbit and fall into the sun. It moved into an eclipse alignment right before the comet struck, and thus it would have appeared as though the sun was stabbing his wife with a flaming comet sword. This act is represented in the scene with Danny's dragon hatching by Cal Drogo's fiery lash, which appears to snake down and crack open the dragon's eggs. The painted leather burst into sudden flame as she skipped closer to the fire, her breasts bare to the blaze, streams of milk flowing from her red and swollen nipples. Now, she thought, now, and for an instant she glimpsed Caldrogo before her, mounted on his smoky stallion, a flaming lash in his hand. He smiled, and the whip snaked down at the pyre, hissing. She heard a crack, the sound of shattering stone. The platform of wood and brush and grass began to shift and collapse in upon itself. Bits of burning wood slid down at her, and Danny was showered with ash and cinders. And something else came crashing down, bouncing and rolling to land at her feet. A chunk of curved rock, pale and veined with gold, broken and smoking. The roaring filled the world, yet dimly through the firefall, Danny heard women shriek and children cry out in wonder. Only death can pay for life. Notice the line about Danny's breasts being bare. That is a call out to Nissa Nissa being told to bare her breast by Azor High. Drogo's flaming lash that snakes down represents the comet, which Danny has just labeled the dragon's tail. Now elsewhere, and on more than one occasion, the tails of Danny's dragons are described like whips and lashes. So a snaking, fiery lash makes for a pretty excellent symbol of the red comet being held in the hands of the Sun King, Drogo, just as I suggest the Red Comet appeared to be wielded by the sun in the sky. That fiery whip cracks open the first dragon's egg with the sound of shattering stone, a vivid depiction of the cracking of the moon by the comet. Danny is then showered with ash and cinders, the roaring filled the world, and a curved chunk of pale rock lands at her feet, evocative of the lunar crescent, which acted as an eggshell for the waking dragons. In particular, it's evocative of a piece of the lunar eggshell becoming a falling piece of rock, and that's exactly the idea. Now the last dragon's egg to crack open comes with the line, the third crack was as loud and sharp as the breaking of the world, and that is a fantastic clue that the hatching of dragons from the moon broke the world. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for our introduction to mythical astronomy. Now, if you're mildly disturbed by all the violence and wife stabbing, that's good. Stabbing someone with a sword is always the wrong thing to do, especially if it's your wife. And as it happens, I think there is good evidence to suggest that the wife stabbing Azor Ahai was actually a villain, and not the hero he's made out to be. I mean, after all, in addition to killing Nissa Nissa, he did supposedly break the moon, which I'm proposing was the cause of the long night. Additionally, a large part of the Lightbringer myth seems to be a metaphor for procreation. Think of the bloody sword as, well, you know. 
and think of the moon as the mother of dragon meteors. So you can sort of see where I'm going with that. In other words, this video cast is only the tip of the iceberg. So if you're interested to learn more, and we hope you are, head on over to LucifermeansLightbringer.com for the rest. We've got a whole series of matching podcasts and essays, so you can actually listen or read as you prefer. There are so many other folk tales to unravel, and many of them allude to the kind of large-scale natural disaster that I'm suggesting today, such as a sea dragon, which drowns whole islands in its wrath, the deadly floods and storms sent against during God's grief by the wind and sea gods, or my personal favorite, the mysterious and notorious Hammer of the Waters incident, which supposedly broke the arm of Dorne and flooded the neck. Even the corpse queen of the Night's King story is said to have cold skin, as pale as the moon, to go with her eyes like blue stars. So there might be some layer of mythical astronomy going on there as well. These are the kinds of things that we get into on our podcast, so we hope you'll consider joining our community of starry-eyed mythical astronomers over at LucifermeansLightbringer.com. And you can also find us on iTunes, and of course, here on our YouTube channel. We also have done a few video collaborations with the great History of Westeros podcast concerning Ashai, the origin of dragons, and that's non-meteor dragons, and the original Azor High's connection to Westeros which you can find here on our YouTube channel or on the History of Westeros YouTube channel. So now, credit where credit is due. Our deepest thanks go to our Patreon sponsors, who make all of this possible with their unwavering support. Thanks, guys and girls, and we hope you like how this turned out. And by the way, if you'd like to become a patron of Mythical Astronomy, then please check out our Patreon campaign, which is linked at LucifermeansLightbringer.com. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld for his great Moon Destruction and Azor High animations that he gave us. You can check out his work at clairdox.de, where you can download for free an amazing hand-drawn map of the entire Planetos, complete with gods and goddesses. Thanks to John Walsh for our new theme music, which is taken from one of his original compositions called Minera. You can enjoy a bunch of his exquisite flamenco guitar playing on his YouTube channel, which is appropriately named John Walsh Guitar. Thanks to the Amethyst Koala for her wonderful vocal performances, and a hearty thanks to everyone on the Westeros.org forums and a Song of Ice and Fire subreddit, who've collaborated and contributed to the ideas that you've seen here over the last two years or so. And, of course, thanks to Mr. George R.R. R. Martin for cramming so much delightful symbolism into our favorite fantasy series. Last but not least, thank you for tuning in. I'm not sure when we'll be doing our next video, as the podcasts and essays are really our main thing, so please check those out. And above all, please share this video with everyone you know who loves A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. Cheers, everyone, and I'll see you next time.